by uh, a group of Italian physicists in the late 1960s about this problem. Uh, the problem of interpreting quantum mechanics at the level of the everyday world. And they say something like this. In our opinion, our work represents the crowning glory and the highest achievement of, uh, quantum, of the theory of quantum mechanics. We are firmly convinced that future developments will consist essentially in refinements of our, our work. Not what is it. And commenting on this, the late Neil Rosenfeld, who was for many years the Gilead of the Holy Few, commented, these authors have uh, conclusively resolved the apparent problems in the foundations of quantum mechanics, leaving no room for extravagant speculation. As far as Rosenfeld was concerned, everything was completely cut and dry, one need not spend five minutes worrying about these things in the future. For a different point of view, I turn to the late Edmund Jones, writing in uh, sometime I think in the 80s. And he said something like this. Quantum mechanics does not uh, use, does not even dare to mention the notion of a quote, real physical situation, unquote. Many say that this idea is philosophically naive, and that uh, the relinquishment of it constitutes deep new philosophical wisdom. I say that it constitutes a violent irrationality. Somewhere well, in, in this theory, the distinction between reality and our knowledge of reality has become lost, and the result is more akin to medieval necromancy than dishonesty. <laughs> so you see that uh, opinions are not only um, strongly held, but very widely debated on this problem. For many years, the debate raged backwards and forwards um, without any kind of, uh, uh, of uh, conclusive outcome. And many physicists simply were not too interested in it, dismissing it as, quote, merely philosophical, unquote. And when a physicist says that something is merely philosophical, what he or she usually means is that you can't think of any experiment which might be relevant uh, to its resolution. And that indeed seemed to be the case for probably the first um, 60, 70 years of the existence of quantum mechanics. But over the last few decades, uh, that picture has changed very dramatically. <coughs> Experiments which uh, are, at least apparently, relevant to this very fundamental problem um, have begun, and uh, over the last decade or so, have, um, have actually uh, accelerated rather than not. That's basically the subject of the So let me start then, uh, start by asking what is the problem. And now I'm going to show you uh, uh, four or five um, slides. Uh, with some have a little algebra on them, and I hope you'll forgive that. Um, I, I promise you, you won't get a lot more algebra on them. That's good. And now I have to press the close this shutter, at which point he no longer is expected. 
and you have a similar uh, apparatus down here, which I'm more than drawn. So very, very crudely, this is how the experiment goes. First of all, let's shut off possibility C. How do we do that? Well, in any given implementation of this, we'll assume that our experimental colleagues do know how to block this part. For example, um, one, uh, as I say, one example might be the young Slitz experiment, in which case uh, you're talking about assay beams of uh, uh, photons, light particles, and you have a, um, a, a, a pink screen here with two slits in it. And all you need to do is to actually block this slit with some fake uh, material. So you shut off probabilities and set them, uh, 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 possibilities set them. By doing so, you measure the probability that a system goes from A through B to E, because obviously anything that arrives at E must have now come from the bed. Let's call that P sub B. Similarly, we can shut off path B. By that, to doing so, we measure the probability that we start from A, go through C, call that P sub C. And finally, let's open both the paths and measure the probability that we go from A to E by, well, we can always say either of these paths. Let's call that P sub B or C. So, uh, why is this experiment interesting? Well, uh, what's the result? Well, first of all, suppose we actually inspect to see whether a particular atom, or in fact, each of the atoms of the, of the, of the set, follows uh, path B or path C. In that case, what we find? Well, first of all, we find uh, that indeed each individual atom does appear to follow either path B or path C. Never know if they're both. Um, and under those conditions, we find that the probability of arriving at E through either B or C is simply the sum of the probabilities of arriving through B or through C. That makes sense, I guess. Uh, if uh, a number of travellers um, uh, travel from, say, Chicago to, uh, um, to London, then um, the total number of, of passengers arriving in London is simply the sum of the number who come through, through say, Toronto and the number who come through Detroit. Right? Those are the two possible numbers. So, um, uh, so this is just the common sense. So there's nothing to be positive about it. Now, I suppose that we choose deliberately to, shut the, to close the shutter and not inspect whether a given atom comes to part B or part C. In that case, we find that we no longer have the total number of, of, um, of, of atoms arriving to be simply the sum of those that <coughs> through part B or part C. Indeed, if we're clever, we can set things up so that when only part B is open, we get a non-zero number of atoms arriving at E. When only part C is open, we get a non-zero number. When we open both the paths simultaneously, however, we get zero atoms arriving at E. That's what's called technically total destructive interference. Now, what does this suggest? It suggests rather strongly that um, whatever you can say positively uh, about this situation, there's one thing you can't say. You cannot say that each individual atom selected either path B or path C then it seemed very difficult, without extreme precautions, to uh, get this peculiar result. Now, what you say positively is perhaps made of toast. You might want to say, well, each atom somehow goes through both paths, or it goes through neither path, or well, the whole question is not being free. But um, one thing you can't say is that each individual atom took one path or the other. Um, okay. Now, those are the raw experimental facts. So far, there's no theory. Now, let's ask what does quantum mechanics um, say? So, in fact, it uh, turns out quantum mechanics gives a quite similar description, though you need a little algebra to work out its consequences. In quantum mechanics, each possible process is represented by a probability, not a probability, but a probability of amplitude. And the probability of amplitude is um, some sense, something like a probability, but except for one thing, it can be positive or negative. The probability can be positive. The total amplitude to go from A to B is the sum of the amplitudes for the possible paths. In other words, for the path A goes to B goes to E, A goes to C goes to E. And then, the actual probability to go from A to E is the square of the total amplitude. So let's now see the consequences of all that. First of all, 
those were shuttle pulses. Then the uh, total uh, amplitude is simply the amplitude go from part B, because that's the only possibility. That means that the mobility in which under these conditions is by definition what we call P sub B is equal to, and now uh, I think the expansion is uh, not quite as it is, but anyway, it's equal to A, B, A sub B squared. Similarly, if part B is shut off, then the total amplitude is the only possibility that the amplitude to go through part C. Under these conditions, the probability by definition is P sub C, and that's then about P sub C squared. Now, the interesting case is if both parts are equal. In that case, in general, the amplitude to go through path B will be non zero, and that to go through path C will be non zero. The total amplitude will just be the sum of those two amplitudes. That's what we call in quantum mechanical language a quantum superposition of these two possibilities. The total probability, which under these conditions is by definition P sub B of C, is the square of the total amplitude. P sub B plus A sub C is squared. Um, and that is equal to, you have to go up here, A sub B squared plus A sub C squared plus 2 A sub C. But we already saw that A sub B squared is P sub B, A sub C squared is P sub C. So this total probability is given by this and this. And if you just had that, that would be a common sense result. Then you get this extra term here, the, the famous or infamous interference term. Uh, and in general, that will not be zero, and so you won't get the common sense result. And in fact, under appropriate circumstances, as we'll see in a moment, uh, the, the total probability can be zero, even though the number of these individuals is zero. Now, what I want to, um, to emphasize is that in order to get interference, the quantities A sub B and A sub C must simultaneously exist, whatever that means, and be non-zero for each atom individually. Not just for the whole collection of atoms, but for each atom. Okay. One more, it's just one more, more um, slide with uh, algebra I've got to show you, um, because it will be essential later. After that, we're, we're clear of that. At the end of the so we'll just be um, Okay. I just uh, uh, bring up, um, explain again what we had in the last program. This is on. Let's suppose that for some reason, a sub C is plus or minus A sub B at random. Then the average of P sub B on C is P sub B plus P sub C, the common sense result, plus the average of this term here, the interference term. However, the, that average is the average of the case where A sub C is plus A sub B, that's A sub B squared, and the case where A sub C is minus A sub B, which is minus A sub B squared, and therefore works out as zero. And therefore, this term, under those conditions, this term completely goes away. In other words, um, if A sub C is plus or minus A sub B at random, then we simply get the common sense result. And that, then, is exactly the result we would have got if we supposed that each atom did go, indeed, go through, through the path B or path C, that every 